It was a brave step by Dr John Wormsley speaking before a coal industry discussion day at Singleton in the heart of mining territory in the Hunter Valley. He noted his disappointment that mining hasn't become more interested in conservation and questioned the commitment of all governments and Australian people to the environment. I'm disappointed because they've got this exploitive vision instead of a healing vision and I think there's more money. I think the age of exploitation is coming to an end. Dr Wormsley believes mining companies could spend more money to rehabilitate old mine sites, money he said which would increase the value of the property. New South Wales Minerals Resources Minister Bob Martin says his government is doing enough. No approval if there's no decent rehabilitation program. It's from go to woe, it must be right. The discussion day heard that the industry employs 14,000 people Australia-wide, creating $3 billion in exports. Peter Ryan, NBN News. It looks like something from the Thunderbirds or Lost in Space, but this is the real thing. It's called the Go-Getter, a prototype machine to work in underground mines. It drives both ways. It works as a towing tractor, a forklift and a crane. There's no machinery in the world that I'm aware of that can do all of those things. The company PJB developed the machine at its Tomago workshop near Newcastle over the last three years. Valued at around $400,000, it's been a risk to produce, but the company believes there is a definite need for it in underground mining. A lot of manual handling is still done underground in coal mines and a lot of injuries are as a result of that. So uh, we set out to develop a machine to take a lot of that manual handling away. and the police air wing joined for the first time in a combined operation more than 4,800 cannabis plants with the potential street value of more than $9 million were seized over the five days. Operations concentrated on the Tweed and Gold Coast hinterlands but the heat and steep terrain caused problems. One officer declared a success and plans are underway for similar ventures in the future. These tiny soybeans are worth their weight in gold in Japan. Trials are underway at Maitland in the Hunter Valley to grow the soybeans. The plan is to sell the crop in Tokyo. The beans are eaten with a drink like we eat beer nuts and it can be a lucrative trade. Conservatively 25 million a year when we start and it will probably build anything up to 100 million dollars a year. The rich river flats here at Maitland are perfect for growing the soybean. The seed is planted in October, then about three months later, the farmer can harvest the crop. The advantage for Australian farmers is that the beans can be grown here when they're out of season in Japan. The Hunter Area Consultative Committee is pushing the Aussie crop, not just for our farmers, but for the spin-offs as well. This is a, uh, a whole industry, this is a new industry, it's not just the, uh, the growing of the crop, but it's also the processing and the transport and distribution to Japan. Peter Ryan, NBN News. Database work, um, as well as the corporate application.
Around 20 skiffs took part in the event conducted in an ideal 10 to 12 knot breeze. Amongst them local hopes skilled engineering, John Boyd's Mediterranean shipping and Darren Nicholson's James Hardy. And it was skilled that gave the visitors something to chase, winning the first of three races from Prudential and Club Marine. Nicholson and his crew of Gary Boyd and Bruce Perry went on with the job in the second race, again taking line honours from Nokia and Mediterranean Shipping, which was christened this morning. Team Lassage foiled the skilled treble, winning the final race, relegating the locals to second with Xerox third. But skilled was a clear winner of the overall point score, providing a major confidence boost heading into the start of the national series, which begins in Adelaide on Saturday week. Mosher began the day four shots behind overnight leader Paul Gow. Veteran George Soren and Andrew Smart are among the big movers during the outward nine this afternoon, but couldn't match Mosher's blistering seven under par round. The Pro-Am is the richest outside the metropolitan area, with Mosher picking up just under $3,000 for two days' work. Through coincidental, they'll be reunited up here with the Mariners. Troy Stone, he went straight into the senior rugby union ranks in Canberra and was a group of five World Cup players. This is all Canberra in the second half. George Greek and Deputy Paul Brown scoring the first of his two tries. Kookaburra attack proved too strong for set pieces and his loose play. Starting late October, I mean, it gives us plenty of time to uh, to work with the coaching staff and to to go through things and uh, and brush up on the skills and the and the aspects and the technicalities of the game that uh, that I haven't been so familiar with in recent times. This is what Newcastle police and local residents want to stop illegal racing on city streets. The Hunter Valley Drag Racing Association is just one group which is trying to establish legal street racing in Newcastle. At a meeting last night, the proposal was given the support of local police. We just feel that there's a lot of areas there to help these kids, to get them to do it legally and safely, because I guess there's an accident there waiting to happen. Bev Woodman says the next step is to get council approval. We're upgrading that proposal now to put into council and hopefully have another meeting between everybody that we need to speak to to get this up and running. Aside for the regular meetings hasn't been finalised but it's believed an area on Kooragang is favoured. The streets would be blocked off for the day's racing which would be organised by the Australian Drag Racing Association. Those involved are confident the proposal will go ahead. Finally, after years and years of, of the people involved trying to do something, it looks now like we might get the support that we need.
An outstanding win by the five-year-old. It paid two ten and one sixty. The trifecta seventeen dollars and sixty cents. Racing was also at Canterbury. Our best race six over twelve hundred and ninety metres. The winner paid three thirty and one fifty. The trifecta twenty four dollars and eighty cents. It's yet another show of support in Australia's small but ailing shipping line. Maritime Union members in ports, including Newcastle, voted unanimously for Canberra to help guide their national shipper into a prosperous future rather than sell it into foreign hands. Selling the Australian national line, which secures our long-term economic futures in the import-export area, would be like uh, giving away our rail system or giving away our um, any transport system. It's the basic infrastructure, it's the foundation of our economic growth. Discussions between the union and P&O broke down with the multinational line unwilling to agree to an Australian shareholding in the company for more than two years after a takeover. There's only one way to get things in and out and that's over the sea. We are world leaders in all sorts of areas. Now we need the political will and the political support to go on with the job that we've been doing for 200 years and the time has come for the federal government to deliver that will. Craig Patton left his home of Port Stephens 10 months ago. This afternoon at Nelson Bay Police Station, he was formally charged with attempting to murder a Sydney mother who was held hostage in an Ashfield hotel for 10 hours on Monday night. She fled the hotel with her young daughter. She's now in a satisfactory condition in hospital with eight stab wounds to her body. It's believed Patton's family live at Fingal Bay. At 10.45 this morning, he walked into Nelson Bay Police Station. A 38-year-old Fingal Bay man surrendered himself to the Nelson Bay Police. He was in company with his uh, family and a member of a local church group. Patton was refused bail at Raymond Terrace Court late this afternoon. He'll reappear in Burwood Local Court in Sydney tomorrow.
They've really gone potty in Morpeth. There are animal teapots, fish teapots, an opera house and handbag teapot. There are the hand-beaten, even dunny and dragon teapots. There are even some that are functional. Noah's Ark might float on a sea of tea and a crocodile pot may swim in it. Mingling with such crass creations, the latest from Royal Dalton, but the flashiest pot of the lot would have to be the Formula One racing car teapot. The spoiler is the handle, the bonnet is the spout. To brew a cup in this one, you take the driver out. But then you just can't beat a good old cup of traditional Billy tea. The teapot exhibition is on for the next three days at the Morpeth Gallery. The annual district convention at the Broadmeadow Racecourse has drawn nearly 3,000 Jehovah's Witnesses from across the Hunter and North West. It's a chance for followers to talk about a number of issues and compare door-knocking notes. Uh, well, we discuss um, uh, how to rear children in this world that's quite difficult. Um, we discuss how to stay close as families. We get understanding of the Bible. The overall theme of the convention is that of being joyful praises. In recent years, the church has experienced a steady growth in numbers. Worldwide, the congregation stands at just under 5 million. We have something like 100,000 people attending here in Australia, congregations all over the continent. And um, we have um, over 60,000 active Jehovah's Witnesses uh, within that number.
Locals want answers and an end to the violent disturbances under their homes. They've been feeling vibrations for about a month now, the strongest registering just under two on the Richter scale. The one the other night was so severe that it was like my husband and I woke up thinking a car had run into the end of our house because it was an impact and the wardrobe door shook, the, the stuff on my dressing table shook. And they're getting more frequent and worse, you know. And it's just really frightening that, you know, we have to put up with this and no, nobody will tell us anything. And the whole house vibrated and it's a terrible feeling. You thought, I thought the earthquake had hit again. Some say damage is starting to appear in plaster and concrete around their houses. But more than anything, the shakes are getting on their nerves. When we had the one yesterday morning, that was really your wake and fright stuff. Uh, just waking up, um, uh, the missus was shaking and, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty frightening stuff. The Mines Subsidence Board is still investigating the cause of the vibrations, but suggests they're probably the result of stressed and collapsing rock strata in the wake of long wall mining operations. Oceanic Coal's Taralba Colliery is closest to the affected homes, but no one from the company was available for comment today. Andrew Lobb, NBN News. An inquiry into the controversial issue of extended trading hours has been established by the Minister for Small Business, Carl Scully. It's been welcomed by many small business owners who claim large supermarkets are sending smaller shop owners out of business. Extended trading hours is the biggest killer of small business in Australia at this present time. The inquiry will investigate the impact late night trading hours are having on Newcastle businesses. It'll also look at claims some supermarkets are engaging in a practice known as predatory pricing. Predatory pricing is, uh, is selling below cost and uh, with the aim of eliminating your competition. Although concerns about trading hours have been raised elsewhere in the state, the Minister for Small Business says the issue is more acute in Newcastle, where smaller shops are engaged in a battle between major stores. The Hunter Valley Research Foundation will conduct the three-month inquiry. Coal trains were stopped at Mayfield this afternoon after police received a report about an eight-year-old boy jumping from an overhead bridge onto a passing coal train. If anybody's ever been to an accident where someone's been run over by a train, they can appreciate the sort of damage that it can cause. The young boy involved wasn't injured, but he's just one of a number of children risking death by jumping onto the coal trains. I would warn any parents who have children who play on the railway lines to seriously have a talk to them and any children who are watching this to uh, stay away from the railway line because you are committing offences by doing it. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Thirty-seven of the country's elite Ironman lined up today and one of the best, Trevor Hendy, became the first of many victims to be claimed by an unpredictable surf. Gold Coast Gold winner Scott Reeves became the race pilot as the Newcastle break played havoc with those behind him. But the former Coffs Harbour competitor had his own problems at the halfway mark, 
surrendering the lead to Kane Huesner and Philip Clayton. The Fickle Surf then snatched another race leader, giving Clayton the advantage. He was again headed and challenged by the tenacious Reeves, who pushed the 19-year-old South Coaster to the finish line. Clayton eventually prevailed for his second Uncle Toby's victory ahead of Reeves, with the gallant Guy Andrews third. Swansea Belmont's Matt Rees and Josh Blair finished 10th and 12th respectively. The same conditions hindered many in the Devondale event with 14-year-old Linda Halfweg and Simone Cotter vying for the lead during most of the race. The pair led to the last wave of the race where they were overhauled by defending champ Reen Corbett who was stood a final challenge on the beach run from Halfweg and Cotter. As a junior, Jenny Ann Fetch was one of the best in the country, having won the 18 Years National Age Championship. She has recently returned from a prolonged stay in Europe where she represented a German club in Stuttgart and also spent time on the circuit with some success. I played with a girl from Queensland and we played two tournaments in Italy and we won the first doubles and this was in a 10,000 satellite and the second week we uh, got to the final and lost to the number one seed. Those results have provided a much needed boost for the 18 year old who now has to make the challenging and demanding move from the junior ranks to seniors. A transition which has proved tough for Australians over the last 15 years. Well I'm going to try. I can't see myself doing anything other than tennis. It's very hard but it's what I want to do and I'm going to give it a go. As will another of the region's promising juniors, Trudy Musgrave, who is also hopeful of a promising summer after reaching the semi-finals of the US Open Juniors. Metford Christian School has grown rapidly since it opened 13 years ago, with student enrolments increasing from 22 to 197. The school caters for classes up to Year 6, but next year it will have its first intake of secondary students. It's hoped the idea of middle schooling will be introduced, which could see an overhaul of the traditional primary and secondary system. It aims to make the transition between Year 6 and 7 smoother. Educational authorities are saying that um, middle schooling, which is from years five to eight, um, is a better way to help students integrate and to flow through with the curriculum. According to Ms Hutton, Christian schools are becoming a popular alternative to state or private schools. Um, Christian schooling is really growing right across Australia and uh, this is just evidence of more growth. Amanda Bolger, NBN News. Father John McPherson told the Newcastle Business Club that Australia has the highest rate of suicide among 15 to 24 year olds in the world, with an estimated 2,000 young people dying every year. Father John is working on a program to reduce youth suicide which he says will be the hunter's gift to the rest of Australia. The messages on the package will come from um, the icons of their own society, the, the people they love, the people they listen to, the people they want to be like. The, the people they can hear messages from. Father John has spent the past 16 months trying to raise $60,000 for the program but is still 20000 short. He today accused the New South Wales and Federal Governments of not taking the issue seriously. If you look at something like the AIDS program which needs every penny it can get and more, but AIDS, the total deaths by AIDS in this country are less than a tenth of the suicide deaths. Anne Lewis, NBN News.
Police say Matthew Scott Spencer from St Clair in Sydney's west had just finished work and was travelling home on the Pacific Highway. He apparently lost control of his vehicle on a sweeping left-hand bend near Kangi Angi. The car spun across the road and slammed into a tree. It took Wyong Rescue Squad members some time to release his body. The accident investigation squad photographed the scene and the vehicle later underwent a mechanical inspection. The fatality takes the state's road toll for the year to 488, four down on the corresponding time in 1994. Amanda Bolger, NBN News.